Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and welcome to yet another RedGamingTip.com video. So let's discuss AMD's upcoming Vega range of graphics cards. After all, in an all too brief demonstration at the company's New Horizon event, along with a multitude of leaks, there's certainly a lot of excitement in the air. So let's go through all we know about the graphics card using the most reliable sources of information we have available. It is worth noting that unlike Ryzen, AMD are rather tight-lipped when it comes to Vega, forcing us to not just use officially revealed information like we did with the Ryzen video, but also combine it with more solid leaks, be they benchmarks or LinkedIn profile leaks, to paint us a picture of the new silicon specifications and how it perform in games. Fortunately, we do have the Radeon Instinct MI25, a GPU for the professional market, which is confirmed to be Vega Silicon by AMD and can use it as a kind of prediction of what the desktop version will hold in store for gamers. But that said, let's start with very basic architecture questions and get those out of the way first before moving into the more technical side of Vega. The GPU isn't just a larger version of Polaris, despite the early reports that and rumours that this would indeed be the case. An image titled FinFET GPU Excitement showed Polaris 11, 10 and Vega, and that is in ascending order of size, leading to the theory that the three pieces of silicon were essentially the same, just scaled up. More, most theorised Vega would have some tweaks here or there, the most obvious amongst those being that it would have a memory controller to accommodate HBM2, and perhaps a few other scheduler changes. After all, the GPU does sport considerably more compute units than the 36 found in the Polaris 10 RX 480. But this is almost certainly not the case. A number of changes have almost been confirmed at this point to be part of Vega. For example, Using the press conference where the lead PS4 architect Mark Cerny went on record and he said that the PS4 Pro took technologies not just the from the available Radeon desktop GPUs, which of course at this point is Polaris, as well as but also future ones, hinting Vega would be a likely donor of such things. According to Cerny, once a GPU gets to a certain size, it's important for the GPU to have a centralized brain that intelligently distributes and load balances the geometry rendered. So it's something that's very focused on to say geometry shading tessellation, though there is some basic vertex work that it will also distribute. To cut a long story short, it would at least appear that Vega is not just a faster version of Polaris due to higher clock speeds and more streamed processors, but also inherits a more efficient architecture. Perhaps meaning that Vega would be GCN 5.0 then. As we know, each successive GCN version brings with it a host of changes, such as better memory compression, better able to work, organize workloads across processors. If this is the case, it would explain why Vega is taking so much longer to put out than simply designing a scaled up Polaris and gluing on the requisite HBM2 components. After all, they have the brain power to do that, they would just simply take a very similar approach to what they did with, let's say, the Fury lineup. Adding to this certainty and giving us a hint of the specifications of the GPU is a LinkedIn post from Zhu Zheng. He is one of the GPU's architects and reveals that the highest end version of a single Vega 10 GPU, referred to as AMD Graphics IP V9, sports 4096 shader processors. This gives us two further pieces of insight. The number of processors in Vega's top of the line part, and that Vega is using IPv9 architecture. For reference, AMD references Polaris as V8. Fortunately, thanks to the Radeon Instinct MI25, we don't just need to take his word on the number of processors, but instead we can do a little bit of reverse engineering on AMD's own marketing claims and maths. The number at the end of the Radeon Instinct MI25 MI6 and MI8 represent their number of FP32 um, performance, the number of TFOPs the GPU can output, and it's clearly that the name corresponds to the TFOP rating of the appropriate GPU, but there's no such figure touted for the MI25. 
AMD have confirmed Vega is present in these cards, and judging from the company's details, they are indeed focused quite heavily on FP16, that's half precision performance, which is unsurprising given the, its potential in deep learning and other tasks. NVIDIA are also pursuing very similar. Using the K88 G3 computer as an easy reference, since it's equipped with just four MI25s, its performance is rated at 100 teraflops, with a note under that stating they're referencing FB16. Thus, we can make the assumption that each Radeon Instinct MI25 is indeed outputting 25 teraflops of FP16 performance. However, because we are interested in full precision, that is FP32, we can half this, therefore that becomes 12.5 teraflops, which is still an awful lot. Okay, so if we have this in mind, we can take the 12.5 teraflops and do some basic maths. For the 4096 shaders to achieve this target, they'll need to run at a rather nippy 1525 MHz, which is quite the up clock from the reference 480, which ran at a lowly 1266 MHz on its core, although there were third-party versions which were capable of hitting rather close to 1500 MHz. This likely hints at a few other changes to improve either voltage leakage or other measures to decrease uh, heat output, such as a maturer process or simply a more brute force approach, i.e. a bigger cooler. And we can certainly see that it does appear to be a dual slot, at least from the couple of photos we do have of it. If nothing else, this is a hint that the fully-fledged Vega 10 should be capable of pushing a serious amount of graphics performance. If this figure is cut for the desktop, well, we'll just have to wait and see. Hopefully it does remain pretty intact. Next up, let's talk about the memory, which is HBM2. Now, the Fiji range of cards, which are the Fury, the Fury X, and Nano, take the honor of being the first AMD cards to support HBM for home GPUs but they do have a limitation, <coughs> excuse me, and that limitation is only 4 gigabytes of memory, which is somewhat lackluster in the age of 4K gaming. Still, they did boast 512 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, and that is still an impressive figure even today, and if nothing else, proved a solid proof of concept for AMD, along with invaluable experience at crafting future HBM space silicon. Unfortunately, things are a bit trickier when it comes to memory figures regarding the Vega's um, memory, both in bandwidth and amount. We can, of course, make a rather safe assumption that it will be using HBM2 for the flagship, and a leaked Doom benchmark, we'll get more into those in a moment, peg the card as featuring 8 gigabytes of memory, assuming that's final. According to Computerbase, an AMD employee who was, well, nameless for obvious reasons, accidentally let slip that the MI25 has 512 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. This means we're either looking at um, two stacks at 1000 megahertz or four stacks at 500 megahertz. Because Vega 10 is shown to only have eight gigabytes of VRAM, it's much more likely we're looking at two HBM2 stacks, providing the total of 512 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. If this also is the case, AMD are probably using a 4-high stack, that is, each stack with 4 gigabytes of memory, and each of those stacks capable of eking out 256 gigabytes each. The same Doom demo, yes, I promise we will talk about performance in a moment, also confirms something else, the device ID of the card. Previously, we'd made the assumption that the device would be for the fabled Radeon RX 490. Well, the answer is right there. With Doom reporting the card as 687F colon C1, this is the very same part we've seen a few times before, not least of all in Ashes of the Singularity benchmarks. Okay, so I did promise you we'd talk about benchmarks, and here we go. So there are two definite sightings of Vega benchmarks, the first being Star Wars Battlefront, being the only official one shown on stream New Horizon. The second is Doom, which was at a press event, and basically images and videos leaked and are now on the internets. Both titles are naturally running at 4K. There are a couple of problems I have with Star Wars Battlefront, 
And that is, it generally was a scene running wasn't the best to show off the graphics card, and a frame rate counter wasn't that evident at all. And that's being very kind in that statement. Lisa Sue did mention that the title was running at over 60 FPS, but that's a pretty weak indicator of performance. And with no V-Sync tearing visible in the demo, that does hint that we are getting 60 FPS or greater. But frankly, I'd be shocked if they weren't using FreeSync for the demo, quite possibly with a frame rate lock as well. So Doom really does remain our best indicator of performance. The footage and images were leaked ahead of New Horizon, and frankly probably forced AMD's hand at showing the card earlier than what they'd wanted to. This may explain the reason that the demonstration for Star Wars was so severely lacking. It did feel like the entire thing was rather last minute, and perhaps less rehearsed than the majority of the event. Well, a few notes about Doom's gameplay. The first is it's said to be faster than an overclocked GTX 1080 by people who attended the event, and that GTX 1080 was running at 1911 MHz. But no one can argue the fact that Doom was running in Vulkan, or be at 4K resolution. Vulkan does tend to give a slight nod towards AMD, and this probably helps somewhat balance out the GTX 1080's overclock. But... The card's performance is still incredibly impressive, and there are a number of reasons as to this. The first, and the most impactful of those, is the absence of final drivers to the card, and that's me being very generous. It's been said that the GPU is essentially just using Fiji drivers. This means that they are not even slightly optimized, and from what the reports are telling us, if you believe them, Vegas specific optimizations are not being used at all. We don't know how much performance will pick up in correct drivers, but I imagine it will be quite a bit. Adding to the driver woes is a debugger layer some sources also are reporting to be running. Once again, we also don't know the, an impact of the performance this will have, but it's likely not just impacting GPU rendering, but it's also likely putting a considerable overhead on the CPU as well. There are a couple of other wrinkles. For example, we don't know if the clock speeds for the cards are at stable levels yet. For example, remember when Zen, also known now as Ryzen, was first shown at 3 GHz for an engineering sample? And now, closer to retail, Silicon has several hundred megahertz on it. I say, I say several hundred because all we know is that it runs at 3.4 GHz base, but turbo speeds are still being decided upon. Well, it could be that Vegas Silicon is still running at a lower speed than final. The last and most obvious problem is we don't know if this card represents the top of the line part. For example, to use Nvidia's current lineup right now, this particular Vega part could be the equivalent of a GTX 1080. Of course, this is just a thought, a thought exercise on my part, and we don't know precisely what was shown or how close to final the product is. Frankly, I'd be surprised if AMD didn't use a top of the line part in the demo but obviously it may not have been up to them. Instead, how far down, how far along the silicon actually is in development. In other words, if the top of the line part simply has poor yields at the moment and they couldn't get one with all the compute units enabled or the clock speeds are just really poor at the moment because they're still bringing it up because it's still several months away from the lease, well, they just did the best they could. Other benchmarks include a couple from Ashes of Singularity which were popped up online and show the GPU to be roughly on par with a GTX 1080. It's not so much that I question these results for Ashes of the Singularity, I question the silicon or drivers here being even worse. For example, for all we know, the same card found at New Horizon was the card which put out these benchmarks or it could be considerably earlier in the bringing up process and not even running at the same clock speed, or the drivers could even be more buggy. I can certainly speculate that the card will be faster than Nvidia's Pascal lineup, because otherwise, well, frankly, it'd be rather disappointing. It would be awful PR for AMD, and to keep potential customers waiting for a product, only for it to show up with no performance increase from the Pascal lineup which was first introduced in 2016 June. I have to say, I have said that Vega destroys the GTX 1080 and I did get some mixed reception for that, but honestly it should for these reasons alone. 
The unoptimized drivers versus a GTX 1080, which was overclocked, and it's still coming out at 10% faster, and it's damn impressive. Plus, we just don't know how far along this silicon is. After all, we've seen how Ryzen has come on leaps and bounds. But with all of that said, we don't know the price point of Vega, or more specifically this card we saw versus the 1080. For that matter, we don't even know if Nvidia has something to counter AMD with. Personally, I'd be shocked if Nvidia didn't announce the GTX 1080 Ti at CES 2017. Meaning it should be rather close to the Titan X in performance if it has a nice enough core clock. There are other reports that Nvidia are working on a refreshed Pascal, likely to fend off AMD with until Volt hits the shelves. It is rumoured to be hitting at some point, I'm going to assume somewhat after Vega, next year. Now, there is a small footnote to this video, and that is a bunch of interest in a recent Mac driver which popped up recently. Several cards were shown, including a Polaris XT2, Polaris 12, and finally Vega 10. Ignoring the obvious one, Vega 10, this does leave us some questions of what AMD's future graphics card lineup will actually be. One does wonder what, for example, Polaris 12 will be. Is it an even lower end part for Polaris 11? Or will it be the reverse? Will it be a higher end GPU? After all, the numbers at the end of this in just instance just refer to design order. So in the case of Polaris 10, it was designed before the smaller core of the Polaris 11. Unfortunately, this is all conjecture, and all we can do is wait for official confirmation. I would say that if you can wait to buy a new GPU, then do so, especially if you have something like a GTX 980, a Radeon Fury, or equivalent. Then, go with whatever the best option is for your budget, be that AMD or Nvidia. As usual, we'll tell you the honest truth of our opinion. As much as I want AMD to be competitive to NVIDIA with Vega, because frankly it's great for us as customers because it gives us more choice, if Vega are the better buy in six months' time, I wouldn't hesitate to suggest that they get your money. Or, if it turns out to be AMD is the better buy for whatever amount of cash you have, definitely go with them. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. As usual, subscribe to us for more tech analysis, reviews and news. And like and share the video if you wouldn't mind helping us out a little bit. But I do have one question for you. Tell us in the comments what you expect of Vega. If you're the proud owner of, say, Pascal, let's say a GTX 1070 or 1080, is there anything AMD could do to convince you to switch? Or are you simply holding out for Vega right now? And if you are, what performance jump would you expect over NVIDIA's lineup for you not to feel that you're, well, Basically, you've just been wasting your time and you hadn't, you should have just opted to go for a GTX 1070 or a 1080. But with all that said, hopefully, you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.